Well, everybody, depending on who you talk to right now, we are in the midst of a revolution in the PC laptop market. And that is because we are seeing the advent of Windows Copilot plus PCs. But what I wanted to focus on in this video is how things are changing because of one single new processor series. And that is the Snapdragon X series. Yes, I know that there are a bunch of reviews and previews out there right now, but ours is gonna take a little bit longer in coming. And that's because on the day before launch, Microsoft and laptop manufacturers pushed out some significant software and firmware updates. After spot checking our results, it turned out these changes impacted our numbers enough, especially in battery life, that pushing back our review to completely retest all of the systems we have on hand was the best choice. And the way I look at it, and this goes for everything here on Hardware Canucks that I have control over, I want accuracy before publishing first. So in this video, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a deeper look at these Snapdragon X series processors, see what makes them tick, and with the help of Qualcomm, answer some of the questions that you guys might still have and bust a few of those myths. Anyways, let's start right at the top by understanding two major branches of Windows. The one most people are familiar with uses x86 and x64 complex instruction sets, which are compatible with AMD and Intel processors. Meanwhile, back in 2012, Microsoft actually decided to make an offshoot version called Windows 8.1 RT, which used reduced instruction sets or RISC. That version has gone through a few iterations up until this new Windows 11 powering so-called co-pilot PCs alongside Snapdragon X series CPUs. And the reason behind that dual OS approach, well, it's pretty straightforward. And I have to apologize to you, this is a massive oversimplification, but hang with me here. So think of those instruction sets as two people that speak completely different languages trying to communicate with one another. It's just not gonna work. So a processor built on one instruction set just simply won't understand what the apps built using the other instruction set are even talking about. You might also be wondering why Microsoft even wants to go down this road to begin with. Well, RISC processors use a less complicated instruction set, so they're generally a lot more power efficient, produce less heat, and can be produced for less money than a traditional CPU. It's why they're used in every smartphone and have huge advantages in the laptop market too. And that efficiency, that is what was so critical for Microsoft because they looked across the pond at what Apple was doing with their M series chips. That is delivering amazing performance per watt, crazy amounts of battery life. The only little wrinkle in that fabric is that Microsoft also wanted a huge speed up in AI workloads. Now, neither Intel nor AMD could offer anything that covered all of those bases. And that is where the Snapdragon X Elite and X Plus are factored into things. So Qualcomm's approach here was to spin up a very unique system on a chip or SOC. There's a brand new processor architecture with the Orion CPU cores alongside significant updates to their Adreno GPU and Hexagon neural processing unit. Those all feed through a massive 135 gigabyte per second memory pipeline that can support 64 gigabytes of LPDDR5X running at 8448 mega transfers per second across eight channels. Basically, high level AI workloads that are done locally need massive memory pipelines. And while a lot of the elements within these SOCs are simply updated or enhanced from previous Snapdragon designs, the Orion CPU cores are completely new and are the reason Qualcomm can claim performance superiority over their competitors in some situations. What you don't see here though is a differentiation between performance and efficiency cores because they sort of took a one design to rule them all approach. So each Orion core is able to dynamically scale from extremely low power modes to higher power states depending on the workload. This gives it a huge amount of flexibility and virtually eliminates the need for two different core types. They can also scale from 3.8 gigahertz on a more intensive multi-core workload like video transcoding, all the way up to 4.3 gigahertz in a lightly threaded single or dual core workload. But you really do need to take this into account. Right now, the chips, which can actually scale to this level, haven't been broadly available. And as for the actual processor series that have been derived from this new architecture, well, there's basically two of them. You have the X Elite and you have the X Plus. But within each of those lineups are several permutations and several products that we really have to discuss. And part of that 
makes buying a laptop with a Snapdragon X processor a little bit frustrating because at least right now, most product pages are simply light on specifications. As a matter of fact, most only make a vague reference to being available with either the X Elite or X Plus. And then when you do finally find a laptop with the processor name clearly spelled out and defined, the name might look like, well, alphabet soup. So what does it all mean? Well, the Snapdragon X part is pretty self-evident and that's followed by a number one to denote this being the architecture's first generation. After that, you'll either have an E, meaning the processor comes from the higher end elite class or a P for the value oriented plus class. Then there's a simple two number skew where a higher number leads to a faster chip. And finally, a variant number that's not really being used for now. So it looks simple, right? And at face value, I, I have to give it to Qualcomm. It is exactly what we are looking for, a straightforward numbering scheme where all you really need to worry about right now is two numbers, that SKU number. Higher is better, lower is a little bit less performant. But look, as with all things, there's a bunch of exceptions that I need to talk about. Because look, at its most basic level, it's pretty straightforward because the X Elite gets 12 Orion cores, whereas the X Plus gets 10. And both series get access to the same 42 megabyte of total on-chip cache, NPU performance, and memory speeds. Once you get outside of those specs though, things start to, I guess, break down. The 78 and 80 SKUs are tied at the hip to a much, much slower version of the Adreno GPU. And speaking of the X1E 78100, it doesn't even get dual core boost, making it feel more like an X plus with a pair of cores slapped on. And that's actually a major problem for Qualcomm's launch because it seems like these slower chips are the only ones shipping with most review devices. So it won't show a kind of performance the X1 series is really capable of. I should also mention the 1DE version listed at the top here is simply a development version and it won't be shipping in consumer laptops at any point. Now, a lot of people have also been asking about the one thing that is super conspicuous by its absence from all of Qualcomm's specifications, and that is power consumption. And according to Qualcomm, that lack of information is sort of by design. That's because laptop manufacturers can flex the Snapdragon X series upwards and downwards based on their needs for thermals, acoustics, overall performance, and the size of the laptop. But what we can say is these things can scale from under 15 watts for a passive thin and light solution all the way up to a sustained 60 watts or more while offering short bursts of 80 watts in a more performance-oriented laptop. Unfortunately, for the time being, software monitoring doesn't support these chips, so there's no way to actually tell how much power is being consumed at a given time. Connectivity is pretty wide-ranging too, with up to three USB 4 and two USB 3.2 and two interfaces, regardless of whether it's the X Elite or X Plus processor. That's backed up by 12 PCIe Gen 4 lanes and four additional Gen 3 lanes. Of those, some are reserved for things like storage, Wi-Fi cards, and optional 5G modems. And yes, there's still some open for future platform expansion. Another thing that needs mentioning is this platform's native support for Aptex HD over Bluetooth. And now this is something everybody was talking about in Eber's video, and it's something that I got really excited about too. And there is good news here and unfortunately some bad news. So the good news is yes, it's included with every Snapdragon X series processor. The bad news is that it's completely optional for laptop manufacturers to enable. If you're looking for a laptop that actually supports it, keep your eyes open for either the Aptex or Snapdragon sound logos. So anyways, you can have the best processor in the world, but if you don't have supporting software, and functioning drivers, it'll be dead in the water. And look, the, the differences with this version of Windows are enormous. So application compatibility and also performance is going to be a huge challenge for Microsoft and Qualcomm. And they're attacking that in two different ways. The first of which is of course, encouraging software developers to re-release their programs with native ARM compatibility for the risk-based Windows environment. And quite a few have already done exactly that. I mean, there's still a huge way to go, but this is the method that guarantees the best possible overall experience. But there are still literally hundreds of thousands of other apps that simply can't or won't be ported over to this new ecosystem. And for those, unfortunately, the only 
solution is emulation. So first of all, what is emulation? Well, remember those RISC and CISC instruction sets I talked about before that can't understand each other? Well, think of an emulator like the software version of a translator sitting between those two people talking to one another in different languages. The only problem is that like any translator, it's less efficient than direct communication in the same language. So adding that emulation layer between a program that was developed for x86 and a Snapdragon processor adds latency and can reduce performance. Probably one of the most famous emulators is one that you've never heard of, and that's Apple's Rosetta. It allowed for a very clean transition between Apple's older generation Intel-based x86 programs towards their new ARM-based M series chips. And here Microsoft's actually taking a page from them too with the introduction of Prism, which is their updated next generation and much more powerful emulation environment. Anyways, this all sounds great. It sounds like emulation is the silver bullet to take care of all of the potential issues, but unfortunately that isn't the case. There's a lot of situations that it just won't work. Like for example, an emulation layer, it just can't access low level system components. That means that a lot of anti-cheat devices that are built into some games just won't work at all. There can also be issues with programs that need access to File Explorer, like Dropbox and even hiccups with some device drivers. But you have to remember, that doesn't mean the problems will stick around forever, and many have actually already been fixed. For example, more and more anti-cheat providers are updating their apps for full compatibility. Dropbox has released a native version of their program, and most device manufacturers have rolled out updates too, even for legacy hardware. And don't forget, the default drivers within Windows 11 are also getting a lot better too. The other thing, that absolutely needs discussion here is how emulation is going to directly affect the playability, performance, and even compatibility with most games, which is why Qualcomm and Microsoft are trying to push developers towards launching their games with native compatibility for the Adreno GPU embedded within Snapdragon X's SoC. But even with support for all of the most modern APIs, its theoretical performance is still only half of what something like a Radeon 780M can provide. And yet, it's only the tip of the iceberg since Qualcomm is dedicated to rolling out monthly driver updates. There's a control panel launching at some point, but it's MIA right now, and compatibility? Well, when you combine both natively supported games and ones that run through an emulation layer, it's unfortunately gonna be hit and miss. Thousands of games are supported, but there's countless more that simply aren't. Luckily, there's a few sites out there to help you, like Works on WOA. Just take note, these lists are user generated and they aren't comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. Also, just because something is listed as running, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll launch without any hiccups whatsoever. But look, I, I think I, I, I have to level with you here. One of the issues that I'm saying is that no one should have, or I don't think they even did assume that every single game is going to be running through an emulation layer without any trouble whatsoever. The fact of the matter is there are going to be hiccups somewhere along the way. And like I said before, there are plenty of resources out there to make sure a game that you want to play on a Snapdragon X series laptop will actually play, or it just lists what the issues actually are. Which is why I'm a little bit frustrated here with all of these suddenly surprised Pikachu faces when a game doesn't launch. If there had been a modicum of research done that could have been avoided. And to that point, another interesting addition to Snapdragon-based laptops is Windows Auto SR, which is being rolled out exclusively for Copilot Plus PCs. It acts exactly like AMD's FSR, Intel's XESS, and Nvidia's DLSS, so a scene gets rendered at a lower resolution before being upscaled. But in this case, Auto SR actually uses the Hexagon NPU inside these chips to analyze and then render out at a higher resolution. So think of gaming on laptops with Snapdragon X processors as something that'll only get better over time. Right now, you'll be dealing with some performance loss through emulation and spotty compatibility in some cases, but as more devices get out there, there's gonna be more incentive to optimize the ecosystem for a better overall gaming experience. And when it comes to gaming, there's also a few questions that people had, like, are you able to run an external GPU dock off of one of the USB 4 ports? Unfortunately, no, at least for now, because there's simply no driver support from AMD, Intel, or Nvidia, nor are are there any public plans to add driver support for these PCs? And that's also why those eight unused PCIe Gen 4 lanes on these chips will probably stay vacant for the foreseeable future. And speaking of questions, there's one that came up over and over and over again. 
anytime we've been talking about these Snapdragon based laptops and that is can you install your favorite Linux distro on here? Well, the official answer is soon. Since Qualcomm has announced Linux kernel support is in the works, but they've also reached out to the open source community for feedback and troubleshooting help. So the intent for fully functional and optimized open source support is certainly alive and well, but it will take some time to roll out. Of course, we all have to be realistic here too. None of these laptops are built for cutting edge gaming performance or massive multi-core rendering output. What they are supposed to offer is generally good performance for the everyday consumer, along with absolutely crazy battery life and excessively quiet performance. And you might remember that when we first saw Qualcomm's claims to those effect, well, we told you to take them with a huge grain of salt. I mean, the Intel Meteor Lake platform is already our battery life champion. So claims of up to twice the battery life in some instances just seem too good to be true. And look, we're still in early testing on a couple of these devices, so I can't spill the beans completely. But let's just say they're blowing our expectations out of the water because we haven't encountered a single situation where a laptop with the X Elite gets under 17 hours in our light load test. And yet, despite good GPU, amazing CPU cores, a lot of interesting capabilities on the efficiency and battery life front, where you're going to see most of the marketing pushed for these new PCs is all about, guess what? My favorite term, AI, Copilot Plus. And look, I have to talk about it because Qualcomm has made a lot of interesting moves on the NPU or neural processing unit front that make Copilot Plus possible. And that's an important point because Microsoft has been insistent to get the Copilot Plus branding. Any CPU needs a high powered NPU that delivers 40 or more Terra operations per second. That is simply an integral part of their Copilot Plus ecosystem. Without one, no on-device Copilot Plus features like AutoSR, CoCreate, or Windows Studio effects for you. And essentially, those specifications are exactly what Qualcomm is offering with the Hexagon NPU, which has evolved from a pretty advanced audio DSP to the current monster NPU that can offer 45 tera operations per second and extremely high efficiency values. And for now, at least before the official availability of Lunar Lake and Strix Point, the Hexagon NPU is the most powerful integrated NPU on the planet. And where this all goes, well, nobody really knows, but the biggest hurdle for both Microsoft and Qualcomm is convincing end users that they need a laptop that is AI focused. That to me is going to be a very hard sell. And that's, uh, it's a little bit too bad because everything about this platform is exciting. It moves us away from that Intel and AMD monopoly that we've been seeing for years and years towards something that offers what the x86 platform never really could. And that is absolutely bonkers efficiency, great battery life, which so many people are looking for. So personally, I'm so excited to see where this goes and how it progresses. But anyways, I'm Mike with Harwood Canucks. I'm going to see you in the next one and I hope you have a great day. Have a good one, guys.